<laughs> Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is July 10th, um, 2013. And for the this week and next week, uh, Troy Hicks, who is um, the has been on Teachers Teaching Teachers more than any other human being. So um, <laughs> this is actually true, Troy. I counted the uh, oh, a while okay. ago. <laughs> but we haven't seen you recently, so it's really nice to have you. Really Thank sure. you. And this is the book we'll be talking about, um, Troy Hicks' new book, um, uh, Crafting Digital Writing, Composing Text Across Media and Genres. And we're going to be talking about audio and video tonight, I think. Um, Troy, if uh, you want to... And what's what's super about this is that we get, the book comes alive um, on TTT because the actual examples of people are that, that Troy wrote about in um, are here with us tonight and will be here with us next week as well. So that's very exciting. Do you want to introduce your your uh, friends here, Troy? Introduce yourself a little bit first, if you're in yeah, yeah. I'll say hello, Thanks. and I'll I'll let them all say hello for themselves as well. So. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm Troy, as, as you stated a moment ago, Troy Hicks, uh, director of the Chippewa River Writing Project at Central Michigan University. I also teach in the English department. I work with pre-service teachers, student teachers, and uh, in-service teachers. So um, pretty much I am working with teachers in a variety of contexts on any given day. And I also get to write uh, about teaching and teaching digital writing. And um, the writing that I do would not be possible without the collaborations that I have with uh, great colleagues like everyone who is here tonight. And so um, I've had the opportunity to write or work or present or teach or just learn with all of these folks, learn from them. And I'm so glad that they're all here and that they can talk about the work that they've shared in the book. And just want to say uh, that you're, at, right before we started the show, you were saying your summer institute ends tomorrow. So I don't know if anybody else has been, has participated or led, or I'm not sure what you're doing there, Troy, but with the summer institute, but you, you must be very tired by now. <laughs> so I really appreciate you coming on yeah. and, and joining us, uh, leading this conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So should we start over on the other end with Andy? Sure, go ahead. Hi, I'm Andy Schimborn. I'm an English teacher at Mount Pleasant High School in Michigan. Um, I'm part of the Chippewa River Writing Project for about three years now and have done a number of um, uh, teacher consultant work there and worked with Troy for the last three years or so. Um, worked with Paul a little bit off and on and uh, Jeremy and some other people look familiar here as well. So it's nice to see people mm -hmm. from last night and I'm in the past and looking forward to a TTT tonight. Hi, I'm Dawn Reed. I'm an English teacher at Okemos High School and I'm a co-director of Red Cedar Writing Project. We're about an hour and a half away from Troy and the Chippewa River Writing Project. And um, I'm excited to talk about the book today and it's been fun to, to work with Troy and all these wonderful people for a while now. So we have Michigan in the house tonight. Should yes. mention that. But go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm Elena Waugh, and I teach fifth grade in um, Bath, Michigan. And I first met Troy, I want to say it was in maybe 2007, 2008, through Project Write, and he kind of opened the world of technology um, up to me and introduced me to a lot of things. And it's been really great to work with him. And I always send him all my finished products to get some... Um, good feedback and everything, so it's been great to work with him. Jeremy. Uh, my name is Jeremy Heiler. Uh, I teach 7th uh, and 8th grade language arts at Fulton uh, Schools in Middleton, Michigan. And uh, I have been a teacher consultant for two years, well, going on three years for the Chippewa River Writing Project and, and have done lots of collaborating with Troy and Andy and um, I have, I'm finally putting names with faces with Dawn and Elena, because I know I've talked to Elena through email before a uh, long time ago, but uh, it's nice to see uh, some faces and some names and finally make those connections. So, Just a quick personal note, Jeremy, uh, next, in September, I'm going to be teaching 6th and 7th graders, so I have a whole list of uh, <laughs> guys like you who are gonna, I'm going to be calling up. Okay. Suddenly, TTT is going to be all about middle school. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> yeah, so. 
Lindsay Hyman. All right, I'm Lindsay Stetzel, and I was teaching middle school at Gull Lake in Michigan when I met Troy through Michigan State. I'm now off to Madison um, to study at the University of Wisconsin. So, but. What are you going to be studying there? Curriculum and Instruction in Literacy Studies. Monica. I'm Monica, and I am in Loveland, Colorado. Um, but I've been working with kids, experimenting with the whole idea of cross-generational expertise, cross-generational disciplines. Um, so a math teacher of 20 years now, seeing the purpose and focus of writing and how to communicate, you know, when you do find things that you're just dying to share. So I'm going to be soaking in a lot of you guys' expertise tonight. Wow, that was the best introduction you've done. I love that. That was good. Thank you. No, seriously, <laughs> that was good. Thanks, Monica. Very clear. <laughs> and so, Troy, do you want to talk to us a little bit about the book? And then, um, as we talked earlier, uh, what we do in the show is we interrupt each other and uh, try to have real conversations here. So please do that as soon as you'd like to do that with Troy. Okay. And there's Valerie Burton coming on. She'll uh, join us as well. Eventually, okay. go ahead, Charlie. Great. Well, I will um, give just a really brief introduction, um, sharing some thoughts about um, the book and how it started and all that. And I'm going to try to do a screen share. Hopefully, this works. Nice. All right. So um, there we have it. Crafting digital writing. Um, one of the things that I often do when I'm doing a workshop, um, don't know that we necessarily will do this right now because um, there would be a lot of dead air time, but <laughs> I will have people, um, I give them two words. I say, um, writers craft and take just about a minute to write about that. And feel free to put that in the chat room if you'd like. I know that there was a Donald Graves Twitter chat on tonight that I couldn't be a part of and I look forward to going back and looking at the archive of that, speaking of writers craft. but. Um, this idea of writer's craft and where it comes from, um, how we got to where we are at after about 30 plus, almost 40 years of um, thinking about the writing process and the writing workshop. And um, we're really at this unique place right now where um, the craft of writing has always been influenced by technology, of course, um, whether it was on a cave wall or a tablet stone tablet or a pencil or a pen and paper or whatnot, but now we're at this point where we have so many technologies and so many ways to produce text um, that we're starting to think about craft in new ways. And one of the things that I Try. thought about... Try. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> right before you get there. <laughs> so what kinds of reactions do you get when, you talk, when people talk about writers and craft? Or are you going to say that? Um, I can say that. I think I'm, I'm still screen sharing and majorly multitasking here, Paul, so I'm, uh, I see that. apologize see if chat. I'm, uh, let me turn the screen sharing off. All right, so what I normally get when I get that, I hear from a lot of people, um, sometimes I'll put up a slide with pictures of like Nancy Atwell, Lucy Calkins, Katie Wood Ray, Penny Kittle, Ralph Fletcher, Barry Lane. Um, all the kind of gurus in that world and often what I'll get are people thinking about leads and snapshots and thought shots and conclusions and um, juicy words mm -hmm. and small moments and that kind of stuff and then what I do before I flip the switch and put up that Ken Robinson slide that I, I prematurely put up on screen there is um, I start to say well what what does that look like now when we make this digital and we have all these different devices and technologies and things that are available to us. Um, how are we being intentional? How are we being thoughtful? How are we actually taking time to craft writing with these digital tools? And then that kind of launches into the broader conversation. And so I, I generally do get a lot of positive, thoughtful, um, heartfelt, oh, I love Lucy Calkins or Donald Graves or you know Penny Kittle is awesome, these types of things. And I think people really have started to connect and understand that idea of writer's craft. And then I try to take it and turn it 90 degrees and start thinking about digital writing, too. Cool. Yeah. All right. I, I, I'll let you get back to your slides. So. <laughs> Feel free to keep interrupting. I, I know I'm, I'm, uh, I will be very, very brief with this next little part. 
All right, am I screen sharing again? You are. I hope so. Okay, so but one of the, the ways not that the right I... screen, however. Oh, am I? Are you looking at Ken Robinson now? No, you're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought backwards I or something. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> the screen sharing is supposed to show everything. Sorry. Now it should. You get a choice of screens. All right. There you go. There you go. There he is. Sir Ken is back. All right. Well, you know whether you think. Uh, Ken Robinson is one of the greatest educational thinkers of this century, or whether you think he's full of edubabble, the fact is that he's kind of the, the face of um, creativity and education reform right now from his TED Talks and all the other work that he does. And so when I was started working on this book a little over a year ago, I, I, I wanted to make that connection and think about creativity. And I like this quote because in it he talks about the idea that we have to be deliberate. Uh, to call somebody creative suggests that they're actively producing something in a deliberate way. And that also connects with a, a shared colleague that Lindsay and I know, Punya Mishra at Michigan State. He talks about uh, creativity and the, the constraints that we have to put on ourselves sometimes in order to foster creativity. Like if you just tell someone to go be creative, that can be very difficult, but if you say you've only got an hour or you can only use PowerPoint but you can't use it in the way you normally would or you've got to try um, using the new technology that you haven't used before, that, that can actually be kind of liberating and force you to think outside of your traditional box. So anyway, Ken Robinson, this idea of creativity, thinking about being intentional. And the last slide I want to show... Whoops, sorry, back one more. I, I, out of respect to the podcast listeners, could you, could you, who aren't seeing this, could you read the quote for us? Sorry. Oh, sure. So, yeah. Ken Robinson quote, being creative involves doing something. It would be odd to describe as creative someone who never did anything. To call somebody creative suggests that they are actively producing something in a deliberate way. And we talk about that idea of being deliberate and having intention. And so the last slide I want to share, and then I really will um, open it up to this conversation because uh, the folks that are here tonight have so much more to say about this and their kids' work um, than even what I was able to share in the book, is that I build off the model of maps um, that I introduced in the digital writing workshop. And maps, as you can see here, essentially is the idea that um, you want to think carefully about the mode or the genre of the text. So even if we think broadly, um, common core-ishly about um, narrative information on argument, um, we want to be a little more specific. Is it a, a personal narrative or is it a historical narrative, fiction? Is it um, a, a persuasive essay where you're only trying to share one side or are you truly trying to create an argument that shows both sides of um, an issue? Um, the oh, second. Okay. Sh should we hear all five and then go back, or? I I don't know. Do I <laughs> this we is the hard it. part about the podcast. Cause yeah, I, I know. So go ahead. Let's hear all five. But I want to go back to mode later. Go ahead. Nah. Go oh. ahead. Yeah, do it. Say. Oh. <laughs> I'll stop. No, go ahead. Okay. So no. so here here's my 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 brief on genre, is is it too often? And I just wanted to hear what you thought and how it impacts on digital, and I'm not sure. Is that I think genre is about joining a particular community and becoming a person of a, of a particular kind of thinker, right? And too often I think genre is understood as text analysis instead of like, who is this writer and who is he communicating to? So I just wanted to, I mean, is that, do you understand the, the difference I'm driving at? And I just wonder what it does with digital work. Yeah, yeah, so does that, I don't know if it matters, but it does to me. <laughs> like it's a really big, really important concept, and, and so then when we think about gamers, right, um, in a digital context, they are somebody in a community communicating with each other. Sure. So we're not, we're not analyzing their texts and kinds of, te uh, the way they're putting paragraphs together. We're, we're analyzing how they interact with each other in, in kind of big ways. Right. Did yeah. I answer my own question? Do you have anything I, to I say? I think you I'm might sorry. have. <laughs> sorry. But yeah, yeah I, I would agree. I would definitely agree. Okay. Well, I'll, and I'll, I'll be brief here. I won't even pull the slide back up because, again, I do want to hear what other um, 
folks are thinking about this. Um, so we have mode and media, and then um, the media has to do with choosing particular technologies, um, different apps or websites, and um, the available things that we have at our disposal now. Audience and purpose, um, it's kind of a situation of same as it ever was. We, we want to be cognizant of audiences beyond the teacher and purposes beyond the standard 1.2, we're going to do such and such, but how can we make this writing really work in the world? And then last but not least is the situation, and that is how much time do you have, what technologies do you have available, um, who are you collaborating with, those types of things. Is it an inside of school project or an outside of school project? All those types of things that writers need to consider. So um, the great thing with all the folks that are on here tonight and what I'd really invite them to think about talking about with their projects is how um, they help students think about using multiple forms of media, audio, video, though especially to communicate to various audiences and for different purposes and with different uh, modes or genres as well. Thank you for that introduction. All right. So, so who wants to jump in? <laughs> or do you want to call on somebody, Troy? Which, which is faster here? Nobody's jumping quite yet, so maybe I'll start with Dawn, since I know that um, she's uh, done this kind of a talk before, and uh, she has a great student example of a persuasive, argumentative type of digital essay. Okay. Um, so when I think about students' digital work, and particularly the essay example that's in Troy's book on with argument writing, um, one thing that... Um, has worked for me with students is offering choice and um, leading them in the discussions to think about rhetorical structures such as audience and purpose and why they're communicating a certain way. So a lot of the examples in the book that are really, really rich and I'm excited about include um, people doing whole class projects. Um, and so a spin that's perhaps not in the book that I think about is that the student who's highlighted Santos um, chose to create his argument that way because of our conversations about rhetoric and how we um, decide to best communicate to an audience. He had to um, publish to a real an audience outside of our class, so he shared with our class, but he had an audience besides myself and an audience um, besides our class, and he chose a digital audience. And so he could have gone many different ways with this, but he felt that one thing he could do was be effective with digital media and um, compose in, in that way. So a little bit about the, pro the argumentative piece that I, that's highlighted in the book. So what did he actually do? So the project that he created yeah, was, was yeah, a... Yeah, well, a, an argument video about illegal, uh, illegal immigration. And so he creates not just a digital story, but it has like movie that goes along with it, um, and his audio narration, of course. So he could have chosen to do a lot of different things, like he could have chosen to do something that wasn't necessarily digital, but he chose to go digital partially because of the role of social media. And at the end of his video, he highlights, like, please retweet this and, and please get it out there. And so he was really embracing um, the role of audiences and the importance of digital spaces and social networking today. So Don and, and others, please uh, help me keep this conversation going here, too. Is it, do you, can, uh, I'd like to know, like, look what it looks like in your classroom, um, a little bit more, like, and um, so, I, and I think you said already, but if you could talk a little bit about exactly what choices you did give them, I think, and then how they chose, and, uh. and, I, and I guess I'm wondering, um, I, I'm hearing some teachers saying. How can I manage all of that? That's a, that's a hmm. lot, you know, all those different choices. Mm -hmm. Is that enough questions for one? 
<laughs> well, I'm interested to hear from a variety of people on this because mine's quite complicated. Mine, um, Go for it. this particular assignment, they and they had to publish. They had to have a real audience. They had to think about purposes for for an issue they cared about. It's a project that we call this. I wish to change. And so students are doing a lot of different things. And so. Um, Managing that can be quite tricky in and of itself, whether it's digital or not. Um, but the digital piece for my classroom just naturally fits into just any type of writing workshop. So that digital piece, although like you might hear that and say, like, wow, all these students are doing different things, it's just like managing a writing workshop. It's just that we've recognized and embraced the fact that digital writing is, is a form of writing and composing. John, I have a question for you. Go ahead, Andy. Um, so I like the idea that you're using authentic audiences with your students and you're having them choose those authentic audiences that they are going to be writing to. How do, you, how do you manage that? I have a hard time myself trying to find authentic audiences so it's not like what you said, just having students write to the teacher, but they're writing to people who are actually going to care and read about and uh, look at what they produce. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Great question. Uh, in terms of audience and managing that, there are lots of ways to go about it. In this particular um, assignment that I'm thinking about, that we embrace, they have to find the, their own audience. So we start with an inquiry question that sort of drives us and do research and then figure out who, who cares about this besides us, who needs to hear this particular uh, audio or particular message. And digital forms of communication allow for a lot more audience and is in many cases. You know, just to follow up on that really quickly, um, Carrie Ann in the chat has um, asked, I'm curious what um, Santos's response was because some of the comments on the video were not so positive. Mm -hmm. So thinking about real world audience, did you talk to him or have opportunity to hear from him after um, he the, posted the video? Those responses were on YouTube? Correct. Okay. Um, now I can't speak speak largely to that because we didn't talk about it as extensively. It was an end of the year project and and um, I don't um, don't have a good response from him. Just that um, he did a lot of critical thinking along the way in terms of what he created and his type of student that I think would embrace it. A lot of times when I'm when I'm working with students in their digital spaces they have to think about it. Like this year I had a student that decided to post something to Reddit and he had very mixed responses. And But before he posted we talked a lot about, okay, what are the things that you that might happen? How are you going to receive that feedback? And so there's a lot of coaching that I try to do beforehand. So I can't speak specifically to this case, but um, sometimes it surprises students, but I think that, that being open to audience response is a big piece of the audience aspect of a writing assignment too. Right. And I would just follow up briefly on that because when you and I talked and you shared this example, um, just to go back to that idea of he knew it was going to go public. He wanted it to go public. He wanted it to, I, I hesitate to say he wanted it to become a viral video, but he took a very strong stance in that video essay and he intentionally wanted to share it on Twitter and Facebook and get a reaction from people. This was um, before the immigration uh, reform. It was really, it, it's when it was first heating up uh, about a year and a half or two years ago. And uh, he obviously did that, which I think is, uh, you know, so whether the responses are positive or not so positive, he definitely accomplished his goal. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, for kind of sake of time to move along, just to let um, both Elena and Lindsay um, speak, maybe Elena, we can jump over to you now and you can talk about sure. how you've done the digital storybook projects with your students. Yeah, um, I uh, my students did a digital informative story called Plastic, Things You May Not Know. And um, at the time when we did this, I was teaching fourth grade. And it was... Um, part of an inquiry-based project through the Disney Planet Challenge, which unfortunately they didn't have this year, but it's one of the greatest things I've ever done. And it ties in everything across all subject areas, areas into this project. And it first started off with 
my students wanted to take care of themselves as you know part of the environment and we got some feedback from um, some like mentor judges said you know you have to tie this more into the environment and I had found a video about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch which affected a lot of animals in this class specifically was very much into animals and they said oh my gosh we have to do something and I was like what do you want to do and someone said let's write a book so they I don't know if you can see this yes we yeah. can okay so they published this book called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and it's a children's book um, and they um, wrote it they illustrated it um, we sold them and raised a thousand dollars which they donated to the Plastic Pollution Coalition um, which is um, a, a huge nonprofit raising awareness about plastic out um, based in California. Well, they wanted to get the word out more and they wanted to tie, we were studying ecosystems and science and um, the water cycle. And they said, well, can we take this book and make a digital story? And earlier in the year, they had made their own digital stories on legends. Um, and I have had at that time one computer in my room. <laughs> So it was a lot of management and, you know, keeping them going through this with the one computer. And so they were really excited. Um, and so they used a lot of the images from that book and tied in a lot of um, facts about plastic and the water cycle and, and how it starts and what plastic's doing um, to the animals in the ocean. Um, and they... So we decided, okay, these are all the slides. They could brainstorm all the different things they wanted to put in the book, and I put them in groups of four. And I had, I think, one or two parents um, coming in to help me. Um, kind of, I had certain parents working with specific groups um, because the groups were random. You know how it always happens. One group just doesn't get along very well. And um, so I had a parent working um, kind of as a mediator in that group. And they decided how they were going to break apart their little section and who was going to illustrate it and what they were going to say. And it was really neat to watch them work collaboratively together. Um, and even on the images in the book, a lot of them, um, they worked together on coloring them. Um, and then when they went to um, record their voices, they each practice what they were going to say and, and in the process I had gone over everything with each group and we put it in order as a whole class and um, it was really neat and so we put it up um, on YouTube and we also sent it to the Plastic Pollution Coalition um, and they put it up on their website and um, you know every day they're like see how many people viewed it and I think we had like over 800 people view it um, and it was about eight and a half minutes and um, it was it was a very powerful um, and, and it was part of our, we put it in our Disney, um, Disney's Planet Challenge portfolio that we had to send as well. Um, and, and there were probably, I don't know, over 400 schools and we were one of the top 20. Um, and it was just really neat to see all the different um, things that we did for that. Lots of different pieces. Yeah. To it. So, and all of that digital storytelling that ended mm -hmm. up in the video, happened after the book was produced? Yep. yep. And it was, the, it was actually their idea because they wanted to get they wanted to get the word out more because they, they had learned so much about plastic and, and what it does to the environment that they just they wanted to tell everybody and share um, you know and they actually um, showed we had the whole school in um, the gym and we showed the video to them um, and they gave them reusable water bottles so they stop buying the you know throw away or the ones you can recycle but the ones they can use over and over again and they just really wanted to raise an awareness about plastic and educate people. Mm -hmm. Elena I have a question for you. You were talking about how students decided to do this video because they wanted to get their message out further. Did, mm -hmm. did students talk about um, the difference in terms of audience from a book to a digital text? Did they see um, more people receiving their message because it was digital? How did that conversation go for you? Well, they, um, they, 
we had talked at great length that sometimes, you know, when things are on their inter on the internet, everybody could see them. And um, on my class blog page, I have a cluster map of all the people, you know, the thousands of people who have come to the to look at the page and from all over the country and the world and um, they knew that if it was going to go online that we had we would have more access for people who wouldn't be able to access our book because our book wasn't in a bookstore you know we had a we had a book signing at the local library and they sold out of them and then somebody read an article in the newspaper and wanted to donate more money so we can publish more books but that was in the scale of, you know, staying within kind of Michigan versus they wanted it everywhere. They wanted that, you know, they were able to see when I would show them that cluster map and, and I talk about when I would put their legends out, you know, you're not writing this just for me. Let's look at this map and look at all these people who are going to come in and look at your story. And, you know, once I published them online, of course, I sent out emails to everybody I know that said, here's some great digital stories. If you can read some and comment on them and give them feedback and praise. And so they would constantly check to see. Um, you know, and I had those faithful ones who would do that. And a lot of their parents also did that too. And it was just, it was it was neat because for them, you know, we're on the younger end. And, and so for a lot of them, this is their first experience with digital um, work. And they think it's fun. They don't think they're, you know, really doing any work, which is great. <laughs> so. yeah, you know, I'm noticing how much in, well, you, you almost said the same thing that Dawn did um, with her student who was tweeting everybody, go see my video. They were doing the same thing, getting out on their networks. And we're actually doing that right now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Troy, with all your help, <laughs> wrote this book. And we're kind of saying, you know, it's so it's a it's a process and texts become nodes in that process, um, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Uh, but I, I, I from a I was wondering if anybody, any supervisors or any parents, said to you, "Oh, come on, get on with it. Are you still on that same project?" You know this. <laughs> This project lasted from September until February. We had a deadline to get this portfolio in. And I, I, the letters I actually received from parents thanking me for the awareness that has brought to their children and them. I mean, they, they loved it. And we incorporated everything into it. So it's not like we were working on it specifically at one time during the day. You know, we incorporated our writing. We had math. We had science. We had social studies. And so it was... It was probably one of the neatest and, and projects I've ever done, and basically because it, it was their idea. It was all inquiry based on somebody had this idea, and we just kind of went with it, and it went in all these different directions. And so, you know, they, they kind of took ownership of that. So I, I, I wonder how we lose the time and focus when we go up in the grades. <laughs> I, I'm kind of jealous of the amount of time you're able to spend on this, both during the day and then through the months. So, so interject ahead, from the chat room, um, Alina, do you, where's your school, which we can answer, it's in Bath, Michigan, mm -hmm. but then um, do you have a class blog, a URL that you could share? Um, yeah, and you know, yeah, the school I'm at right now um, is in Bath, but the, when I did the project, I was down in Leslie. Yeah. Um, Right. So, but I do, just tell me how to put it, can I just put just, it on the chat? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, which chat? We'll find it. No matter okay. What. But, I, but can you just say it also? Oh, yeah. It's, somebody might be listening. Yep. It's um, E-W-A-U-G-H mm -hmm. dot edublogs dot org. Thanks. Okay. I hear somebody typing, so hopefully they're grabbing that already and we'll <laughs> throw it in the chat room there. Thank so I, one, one thing, and, and this, this I think will form a nice um, transition between Elena and Lindsay here. So with Elena, your project was very collaborative. Each mm -hmm. child had some drawing, each child had some writing. Quite literally, each child's voice is in the digital movie, and that took a lot of coordination on your part mm -hmm. as teacher. Um, and so now a different type of collaboration. Lindsay, you had 
your students work in pairs or small groups to create podcasts and it's a different type of collaboration but um, equally as valuable so I wonder if you might tell a little bit about your experience creating the uh, book talk uh, book trailer podcast yes uh, so my project was basically a take of the traditional is it book yeah, talk. We got you. Go okay, mm -hmm. uh, that most English classrooms already do, um, but the difference is instead of doing an individual just presentation on a book you read, summary, characterization, they have to work in groups to write a script, which in itself adds a whole other element because they're thinking about how a script is different than just a one-person presentation, how to incorporate narrator and character and alternate voices. And then we add on the next element, the digital element. I mean, they collaborate on Google Docs, so we're already um, using a digital element. But then they record it as a podcast. So they have to think about how the medium is different. There are no visual cues, and they're so visually driven um, in general at this age that they have to think of how to just communicate a message via their tone of voice and auditory cues. What, what age again? I'm sorry. Oh, it's middle school. So okay. um, this was with seventh graders. Okay. So then they work collaboratively to um, come up with music and sound effects and record their narration and put everything together into a polished piece um, and how to be critical and, and very discerning about not being over the top, but how to communicate a clear message entice their audience, which for them was their classmates, and come up with a piece that they really can take ownership of, which is really what I was taking off of the last project that Elena was speaking of, is how much ownership the students had um, and how that really drove the project because they had a choice and they had a voice. And I think that's really what digital can offer to some of our more traditional writing forms because it expands the opportunities. Yeah. Say that again? I mean, I heard you, but I'll push back and say, why digital? How does digital expand choice and voice? Or because, it, I mean, at least in my experience, we went from, you know, you, you do this book talk for 30 kids that you're hoping are still awake somewhere in the classroom, mm -hmm. to now you've published an MP3 file that's on the school webpage that now the other classes are listening to. And... Mm -hmm. Actually, now my students at Grand Valley are listening to, and now your parents are listening to, and there's so much more drive to, to really put forth a strong effort because there's more of an authentic audience mm -hmm. than just, okay, no one's going to pay attention and the teacher's going to grade me and I'm just going to get the grade. Students really wanted to inspire and excite their classmates to read the books that they liked. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to interject quickly and just talk about the craft element here because when Lindsay and I were emailing back and forth and even in her emails I heard the passion about this project. Could you talk a little bit about how you had students um, incorporate music, incorporate sound effects, incorporate multiple voices um, to create the book trailers and talk about some of those craft elements as well and why it had to be collaborative and how you, you planned for that? <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think this is something I really liked about the project was this goes back to the word intentional, is trying to incorporate as many elements. I mean, we read books in literature circles, and now we're intentionally writing a piece, and now we have to try to express mood and tone. And that was something that, for seventh grade, they understood that so much more quickly with music, how to create a mood which later you work into how writers create mood with setting and word choice. At their age, they just they get mood through more of what they hear. Um, this is an eerie, creepy setting. Mm -hmm. We need to incorporate that um, and when to use the sound effects. The hardest part for them, actually, was how to keep an audience's attention, and they were very critical of their own pieces because they realized we should alternate voices more. We need to mix up. We need to clarify what the narrator is saying here, and it's going to segue into a character voice. 
and it, it included a lot more collaboration and critical analysis of each other um, than just simply writing and then reading what they wrote. I feel like their writing continued to develop as they listened to it and found there were some gaps in their understanding and they wanted to clarify that for their audiences. Not everyone was successful, but quite a few people mm -hmm. managed to solve those conundrums. And how did, how did you find the time in the curriculum to do this? So it does sound like it took time. Yeah. Well, it didn't take as much time. Um, if I were teaching there now and they're one-to-one, -one, it would have taken nearly as much time. Um, but I started out the first year we didn't have as many computers, so we had to handwrite the scripts. We just did it person to person in small groups. We spent one day picking out music and sound effects in the computer lab, two days recording, and then I just built in an extra day. So we really only spent four days in the lab, um, but a lot of that we had to, was trial by error, was um, what can we do before we get in there. And as far as how much time it took, for me, it was a culmination of so many elements. We were hitting all of our academic vocabulary. We were responding to the literature. We were writing. We were focusing on the dramatic element um, and presentation and speaking and listening. So I, I could have written, I don't know how many standards it hit, um, but it was really more of a culmination of so many elements of what we were doing already. Yeah, that's my favorite feeling about uh the common core. It's like, how many do you not hit when you exactly. do a project, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Anyway, cool. Any other follow-up questions others have or thoughts? Oh, as you as you just did that, sorry, <laughs> I, I remembered. You, you just said you did this more than one year? Yes. So that feels like an interesting story to tell, too, for somebody who wants to start this this year and then, like, so how did, how did you develop as a teacher in, in this project? So, and I feel this way often with technology tools. The first year, you just kind of have to dive in and be prepared to maybe see the blog not really work right. Or for me, we had some technical issues. Uh, the next year, we added the Google Doc element. Um, and I did kind of more of a reflection afterwards. So Which is computer time, too, right? Yes, yep. We had to have yeah. more computer time. Just, just a quick <laughs> Today uh, in a workshop, I said, uh, a teacher said that what she sees is very different than what we're doing um, is if they use computers to just make the end product, right? So it sounds like you started incorporating use of computers for earlier in the process. Yes. And mm -hmm. when, when you do that with writing, you can be in the conversation because they're writing on a Google Doc, but they're also chatting in the sidebar. And you, as the teacher, are watching all of the groups have conversations. And you can converse right in there with them. And you're more part of the writing process and seeing it happen than just getting the written form at the end that says, this is what we produce. Uh, so that was actually more helpful for me to support them in trying to organize their writing piece. Um, and then eventually, it just became, the process became more streamlined. Um, I added more of the after they finished the project, reflecting on it and analyzing peer work, which they were very open and honest and um, friendly about. Um, that helped them to, to just look at the whole process and see how far they'd come. Maybe I should know, but I don't. How did these get published in the end? Uh, and this evolved as well. Uh, okay. The first year, I just posted them on my class website, which was off of the school page. By the final, because I did this for five years, my final class, um, we had digital portfolios, and they had to uh, have a page of their portfolio dedicated to their book. And they had to figure out how to publish the MP3 on their digital portfolio to kind of highlight their book. So. And there's a little sidebar conversation going here in the chat room about the tools. And I was mentioning that. I think the one you shared with me, Lindsay, was an aviary. Yeah. But aviary uh, bit the dust about a yes, year ago. Did. And so I keep recommending Audacity to people, but then there's a download and they have to get their IT people to do it and this and that. And I didn't know if anyone else yeah, knew of a good on. online. <laughs> oh, I know. Believe me, we talked about this today in our summer institute. Yeah, I know. Does anyone know of a good online audio editor now? Now that. Uh, um, On PCs, Audacity has a Chrome plugin. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't know. Oh. It, it, it doesn't work on Macs yet. But okay. That's one possibility. You can't edit on Vukuru, can you? I don't think I, you can. I didn't think so. Straight recording. Okay. Yeah. So um, while we're on tools, I wanted to ask um, the, the Elena and, and Don, uh, you guys, you mentioned YouTube. So just sidebar, we, we, whenever YouTube comes up on the show, I, I always want to make the sidebar. So is YouTube open in your schools? In, in my school, it is. Mm -hmm. it is. Mine too. Oh. So, uh, and you, you didn't have to fight for that or ask for it? it when did that start getting open? I mean, that, it's, it's it's always well. This last year was my first year in Bath. Um, in Leslie at the school I was at, it had always been open. Um, and in Bath, um, there are some things on YouTube that I think are blocked. Um, but yeah. our IT guy is, you know, he's really good. So if there's something I need unblocked, he'll 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 do that. Cool. He trusts my judgment. Um, so. Well, good. I, I wish it was open in more places. Yeah, I, think, <laughs> I think, yeah. I YouTube's. agree. Yeah. I'd like to interject really quick, too. I think you can be creative with that because in my school, YouTube isn't open to everybody. YouTube is open for teachers, and we have a certain number of logins that teachers are given. We're given, like, two or three logins. Um, but I became friends with the people in the media center, the media specialists, who control the amount of logins, and so they were able to give me like 30 logins for myself. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll go to a computer lab where there's like 30 computers. We also have a program called Land School, so you can sign in to all 30 computers at once, doing a specific project to do YouTube that way. So it's funny because they, my administrators will say, well, we don't like using YouTube, but then every time I do, and they see what the kids produce, they're like, wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, right. So I think sometimes you can be blocked, but if you can find creative ways around it, I think it can be useful as well. Yeah, and we should keep doing that. But I, but I also always want to say, you know, in, in public forums like this, you know, let's, let's, let's also keep fighting to get that open. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important too. But mm -hmm. at any rate, so yeah, but that's a good. Actually, you went much further than I've heard before. You opened up thirty. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. Valerie, um, do you want to check in with us? Hi. Thank you for coming by. You've been Hi, you, thank tell you us for what having tell me. us what you've been up to. Valerie is uh is now the writing project uh I don't know what you are. You're all I over know, the place in the writing either. project. So so what have yeah. you been doing recently? Hey, introduce yourself um, briefly and then you're done. Okay, hi, Valerie. Burton. Um, I'm an English teacher from New Orleans. I teach what English three, English four, AP Lit. Um, this summer, I saw a notice that the Dakota Writing Project has a digital sandbox open, so I was able to jump in on that, and um, we're playing around with media and doing a book study. Sorry, Troy, not your book. Maybe next time. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not offended. <laughs> Um, Those are our but, friends over there. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah we're, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks of um, playing around more and learning. And all of you guys have given me some great ideas to um, take back to class. No, we have no YouTube. That's <laughs> not even an issue. They are not going to open up YouTube for us. Valerie, I'm going to come the down there and talk to your principal. I've got to tell you. Anyway, I so wish you would. I wish you would. I keep trying. I couldn't get NPR invited me to be part of a Twitter chat a couple of months mm -hmm. ago, and I couldn't even get the IT guy to open up Twitter for me for like okay. two hours to be part of an NPR education Twitter chat. And I'm like, how crazy is this? All right. You know. So but you, you anyway. must find ways around it. We'll we'll work with you. So. Cool. So oh, thank yeah, you. that's what my cell phone's for. So mm -hmm. you've been in that sandbox. I'm not sure what we are, but um, thank you for coming and joining our part of the playground here. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, um, thank you for having me. Jeremy, do you want to check in here? How are you? Good. So, how, how are you? You're friends with all these folks, right? I yeah, think, absolutely. Uh, so how's, how's the sound into you? Oh, actually, should people great. read Troy's book, or what do you think? Well, I'm just <laughs> I'm just starting to dive into Troy's book because I've been doing my own stuff at this point um, this summer. But uh, 
Um, you know, I think Lindsay, listening to Lindsay, I thought she brought up a good point because you were asking her questions about, you know, teachers and bringing these digital tools into the classroom. And I think it kind of goes for even what Elena and Don were saying. You know, a lot of these tools can seem overwhelming. But I do think that Lindsay brought up a good point with when you do something the first year, I think it is important for you to just kind of see what's going to happen with it. Um, I did that this year with um, uh, school with school, well, no, not with Youth Voices, with Schoology. Um, okay. Youth Voices, I, we, I felt Youth Voices was, was, a, was a success with just the, with the few kids that were on it um, because they got feedback from other kids. Um, but I think you have to see how things are going to work and then go from there. And I always tell teachers, and I think Andy's probably heard this and Troy's heard this from me, but when I present to other teachers, I always tell them, you know, take just one or two tools per year and work with one or two tools per year and then over a span of five years now you've introduced yourself to ten new tools and you have ten tools to work with mm -hmm. you know so you don't feel so overwhelmed because I think that's what happens when people hear about all these great tools that you can use and everything else is that oh my gosh what am I going to use in my classroom well just choose two that you like you don't have to be the expert in it sometimes kids find ways to um, the find the uh, like the features better than what you do, and they can show you these neat, fancy things that the tools can do, um, and and that's that's learning beside them, and I think that's really important too uh, for everybody to understand is that you need to be able to be willing to learn beside your students as well as um, you know stepping out of that expert role. But yes, read Troy's book. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just so, to, Troy, uh, back to you. What do you yeah, I was going to say, yeah. just to put in a pre preemptive uh, request <laughs> for another episode in about a year, uh, Jeremy and I are co-authoring a book right now, too. He's a little too modest to say that right now, but uh, we, we should have something on the shelf about next March or April, hopefully, at the latest. So, um, so But, Troy, could you, could you, uh, could we, um, I don't know how to ask you this question, but You've been very prolific. I mean, it's it's not just because you know you know publish or perish, right? <laughs> what's what's your passion behind getting the, the message out like this? Well, I I, I didn't think, tell you I was going to ask you that. By the way. No, you didn't. But I think <laughs> what we're doing right now is actually indicative of this uh, of what I tried to do. I mean, I've met all of these people through either a national writing project or other intensive, meaningful professional development experience. And you just immediately form a relation and a connection. And um, it's like Elena said, like, just send me an email, keep up the conversation, follow you on Twitter. Lindsay and I met through Michigan State, and um, now she's going on to graduate school. I can't wait to see what happens for her as she, you know, enters the profession of English education. Dawn and I have been collaborating now for 10 years. Um, uh, Andy and I, I mean, and Jeremy are through the writing project and other NWP connections over here, too, with Valerie, and it's just, you know, it, it's really a wonderful opportunity. I, I want to help teachers who are doing really good, positive, thoughtful, intentional work get the message out. And it's not not even so much about, oh, there's so many bad things about teachers and teacher bashing and, you know, waiting for Superman and, you know, all those bad things. I mean, that is out there, don't get me wrong. And there are other people like Steve Zummelman, who you've had on your show, Paul, who, who do a very good job of that advocacy work. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's the fact that we have... Um, this opportunity right now and you know kids are holding all these devices in their pockets and their backpacks and they're either gonna you know create digital footprints or, that are ruinous or they're going to actually be intentional and thoughtful and creative and we can help them do that so that's kinda why I'm passionate about it and I, I think about all that with my own children as well so mm -hmm. yeah so I, I was just hoping that we might kind of go around as we're getting ready to close and maybe come back to that idea of being intentional and being creative and being deliberate and wondering what kind of words of wisdom or final thoughts each of the, the guests here tonight might have to say. But if you have something else that you wanted to close with, right. <laughs> does that one work? Sounds like you're talking the talk. Okay. <laughs> so um, maybe we could just kind of go back and start with Andy again and work our way across. So if you have some quick words of wisdom for us in these last five minutes that we can be thinking about being intentional with uh, crafting digital writing. 
Sure. I always think of um, you want to think with the end in mind. What is it that you want our students to accomplish, and how can we help our students to do that? Mm -hmm. I appreciated. Um, many things that are said tonight, including the importance of being able to learn beside our students. I think oftentimes people get worried about the technology and feeling like, oh, I've got to learn, I've got to figure this all out, I have to know how it works. But if you, one thing I appreciate about crafting digital writing and Troy's approach um, in the classroom is the role of making it about the writing and focusing on audience and purpose and why are we doing this and how are we crafting it um, and then letting the technology piece just be a natural part of it because that's a way that we do compose in our world today. Um, I was just going to say, um, you know, just from the elementary level, um, especially for some teachers who've never done this and want to do this, I think the best um, way is to do a collaborative project together as a group um, and then kind of from there, I think, let the individuals, you know, you can do it in all different subject areas. Um, but once you feel comfortable doing it, um, it'll be a lot easier to manage when you have more than one um, project going on at the same time. I just think that we have to understand. I think that. By the way, this is Jeremy talking, oh. and that was just Elena. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I think that we have to have an understanding as educators that that our students learn differently today. Um, it's it's not, and I, I always go back to kind of what Troy's thinking was is that pencil and paper is it was a technology or it is a, a certain type of technology, and it's the same. It's the same thing with a cell phone, an iPad, or a tablet. Those are forms of technology. It's just the shift that's occurring and we have to be willing to um, teach our students how to use those things and, and piggyback off what Troy said responsibly. I think that we, ha we have a responsibility to teach them how to be good digital citizenships and how cit citizens and how to use those tools in a responsible manner um, with, with uh, using it with writing. <clears throat> And now we have Lindsay. Well, this is my TPAC shout out, but this goes <laughs> back to being intentional uh, and that not just feeling overwhelmed by too many tools and how to just find a tool and use it in your classroom, but to find something in your classroom that your students are struggling with or some type of problem, a way to enhance the writing process or the final project and then seek out tools that will work for that real intentional purpose. Um, very important mindset. Define TPAC? Uh, it is, do you want to define it, Troy? Yeah, technological <laughs> pedagogical content knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you. link right now. <laughs> Good. And there'll be a link for that. And if you Google TPAC, you'll find it online too. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to mention and and you know, it's just I noticed it tonight because this is what I'm noticing now. I think is is how much how much of the work is about becoming a particular kind of thinker and beer in the world, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that that was interesting to listen to, and how how much these yeah what I said earlier about how the different texts are nodes along that process of becoming somebody. Um, and so identity is way, way important to all this thinking, it seems to me. So it's one of the things. And, and I got I to gotta say, uh, one of the first places I learned that was in a summer institute with the uh, you know, New York City Run Project. Um, you know, I came every day in that summertime to become something different, right? It wasn't, it wasn't to write, although we did that. But so it's that becoming process that I'm hearing. You know, it's, it's really interesting. Valerie, you have any final thoughts? And then we'll let, let Troy have last word. <laughs> Where are you, Valerie? We don't hear you. Must be muted. Oh, you, you might be muted, Valerie. No. Okay, we're going to have to catch up later with Valerie. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, no. oh, we got okay. you. Okay. okay. Um, just that um, y'all inspire me to continue to do, I guess, what I do. 
because I got into tech integration through the back door. I just dived in head first, started doing, didn't know what the hell I was doing. I just appreciated the fact that Walk my parents brought us. Walk those metaphors, man. Like you dived through the back door? Man, go ahead. I, I did. I did. They bought us laptops. <laughs> and I used them, and then, of course, I got used to using them, and then they took them away. But I just knew I needed to utilize the equipment that they had given us. And now I'm looking at why did I do some of the stuff I did? Why did I have my kids make digital stories? Why did I have them use the flip cam or the whatever? And for me, it's always this one boy, Alexander, who's opened up the doors for me. I couldn't get him to do anything with pen and paper. But I gave him a laptop, I gave him a movie maker, I gave him a PowerPoint, and this child worked for three days to give us a digital story that made all of us cry. So it's it's because of moments like that where he was able to say through a computer more than he had ever said in nine months in my classroom. You know, it's just the power of the technology, and, and we need to embrace it, and we need to teach them how to correctly use it. And thank you very much. I'm done. And I just appreciate that you mentioned a product that uh, isn't here anymore, and that's the second or third time that's happened tonight. And we're still hearing those products go away. <laughs> yeah, um, Troy, uh, any summary tonight, and then what's happening next week? Uh, the summary tonight is to simply say thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here tonight, for contributing to the book, and uh, most of all for doing what you do in your classrooms every day that you're with students. So. Um, that's my, my final thought. And then the preview is that next week we get to hear a little bit more about um, crafting digital writing. And we will be thinking about creating web-based texts like websites, Google Docs, wikis, those types of things. And also about uh, presentations. And so Andy will be back with us next week um, to talk a little bit more about how he has his students create visual arguments with uh, Prezi. And we'll also be joined by um, two other Michigan folks, so we'll be in the house again next week. We'll have Erin Klein, uh, who will be talking about um, alternative tools that she uses to help students present going beyond uh, PowerPoint listeners. And then Beth Nelson will be here to talk about how she has her students craft uh, digital essays using wikis and Google Docs. So where do we get this book? I, I'm sure that if you went to one. Amazon or yeah, yes. um, but is it is it a is it a Kindle book yet or a uh, digital book yet? No, but I'm glad you asked that again. I thought I'd ask. Heinemann is listening. <laughs> um, <laughs> Heinemann, um, without going into too much detail, mainly because this is about all the detail I know, um, is they, they Heinemann is not getting along well with Amazon right now. Uh, okay. So yeah. there's probably not going to be a Kindle specific version and they're waiting to figure out how they're going to distribute ebooks. But this is about the oh half dozenth request I've had in the last two weeks and I, I will make it's sure my a, editor it's knows. It's the first book I've read in a year and a half in, on paper, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I know. And and the irony is just abound. I, I can't even I can't okay, even go into all of it. So so thank you so much Troy. Um, and please come back next week, y'all. And um, we uh, broadcast here over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network. And thanks to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo for starting up that uh, community and keeping it going here. Uh, we'll see you next Wednesday. Talk to you. Thanks. Good night. Thanks so much. Nice.